Can they speak up if uh, yep, question? Yeah, let me try I'm unmuting everybody right All now. right. So we're just going to unmute you guys. All right. There we go. Okay, there you go. All right. So stop me um, if you need to. And again, we're going to have uh, a lot of time for discussion at the end. So when it's, I just want to put a bit of framework around this. So when we're talking about accessibility, we're really talking about uh, your system being accessible to people with a diverse range of hearing, movement, sight, cognitive, and ability. Uh, so there's the four main things that we're talking about accessibility. We're talking about people, and uh, it's estimated that that's about one in five people who have a disability uh, in America. So that's we're talking about the population of California and New York State. And now when we talk about accessibility, most people say, oh, you know, it's all about blind people. But actually, when we talk about these four groups of people with disabilities, the, the biggest group is actually the ambulatory or the movement group. And then it goes inverse up for cognitive, then hearing, and then visual. So accessibility is, is more than just um, you know, blind people and screen readers, is kind of what I'm trying to get the point across. So one more second on, on these four categories. When we talk about ambulatory, we're talking about people with cerebral palsy, quadriplegia, maybe people with arthritis or developed an injury, some type of movement restriction. When we talk about uh, cognitive or mental ability, we're talking about developmental delays, people with dyslexia, and Down syndrome. And the way that people interact with a system, a web system like Smart Simple, uh, can be different for all these different types of groups of people. Again, with hearing, we're talking about deaf to hard of hearing to people who have developed a hearing loss. Uh, and visual, of course, is not only blindness, low vision uh, and color blindness, as well as vision loss. All right. So now that we really kind of have a framework for what we're talking about here, we're talking about accessibility in relation to the Smart Simple platform and who this encompasses. The next thing is really assistive technology. And there's lots of different types of assistive technology that people will use. So I've got the eye tracking device here, a switch, which allows you to map to a keyboard, uh, the SIP Puff device, refreshable Braille keyboard, and uh, screen readers. So these are a lot of the typical assistive technology that people will use uh, with a system like ours. Is there any questions before I keep going? I'm just trying to keep this really high overview before we get into the question and answer. Okay, so let's go to guidelines then. So somebody asked, you know, what guidelines do we follow here? Well, we follow the international standard, which is the WCAG 2.0. So it's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, which were just updated in 2018. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. And um, it's basically a set of guidelines that have a testable success criteria. These are broad guidelines. Uh, and most people are ranked with A, AA, or AAA, uh, being what level of, of uh, coverage you get. There's four guiding principles with these. Is it perceivable? Is it operable? Is it understandable? And is it robust? And by robust, they mean is it going to work with the various assistive technologies? Now, in addition to WCAG 2.0, we also subscribe to uh, what's called ARIA, or the Web Access Initiative Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Now, this is a standard that's set out for web developers, uh, and it's intended to increase accessibility of pages with dynamic content. So one of the problems people have is when you start changing content on the page, you have to let the assistive devices know, for example, that content has changed. Because we're not dealing with static pages anymore of content uh, in, in the old web that we used to use. And there's also a lot of newer user interface components. So if you think of WCAG as a kind of a general or broad set of guidelines, you can look at uh, ARIA as being very specific standards around semantics, the structures, and the behaviors of the technology. So we're incorporating ARIA. We always subscribe to WCAG 2.0. Uh, and that leads me on to the legislation. So for those of you who are in the States, uh, Section 508 is the big one, as well as the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and both of these things are really trying to, to, to prohibit the discrimination of disability. In Ontario, it's AOTA. Um, but there's all sorts of different um, legislations in different jurisdictions. All right. So now I just want to touch on compliance for a second. So how do we ensure that our systems are compliant here at Smart Simple? Well, we've got a dedicated quality assurance team that tests the platform always. They're constantly testing it. We've got dedicated people to this. On top of that, we also have an outside consultant who is a completely blind user who does both accessibility and usability testing on the platform. Uh, quarterly. Uh, plus, if you have ever run into a problem, you can always call the support line, and we have an escalated procedure for any accessibility-related issues that come along. 
So you might say, well, how do we test this stuff? Well, the way we've been testing it from now is we've been always using the uh, JAWS screen reader with Windows and Internet Explorer on the desktop. And that is the market leader when it comes to uh, screen readers right now. So you can see uh, this survey that shows most of the people who are using screeners on a desktop are using the JAWS variety, and that's, that's what we've been testing on. As of the next upgrade, we're also starting to do our testing on using VoiceOver for all of our Apple users on uh, using Safari and on the iPhone. So that way we can hit both the, the market leader for the mobile experience for Apple and the market leader for desktops uh, on Windows. So that's, that's what we test with uh, when it comes to testing the screen readers for accessibility. So let, let's say you want to check to see if your system uh, is accessible. Well, there's a really easy way that you can go right now and, and get an idea of how accessible your system might be and get an indication. And one of the ones I like to recommend is the uh, Wave toolbar, if you guys haven't heard of it. It's just an extension you add to your browser, and it's totally free, and it shows you right on the page if it discovers any um, sus suspected uh, accessibility issues. And if you find something, you can always call our support team and we can work through it and make sure that it is a legitimate issue and, and help to resolve that. Uh, some other nice tools uh, for getting kind of an indication that, that are free and easy is uh, Google Chrome. There's a, if you hit F12 for the developer tools, you get an accessibility audit there, which you can run and it'll, it'll run. Now that's only for external facing pages, but it'll give you another indication. Uh, and there's another site here that also does that and gives you a good indication of any possible uh, suspected errors or issues. So when, when you do testing for this type of thing, the number one thing, these are actually the number five things that, that people use assistive technologies, specifically screen readers, this chart, find that are problems for them. And the first one being CAPTCHA. A lot of times, although Google says CAPTCHA is uh, totally accessible, a lot of people argue the opposite. Um, so CAPTCHA, if you haven't seen it before, looks like this. And it can be a bit of a hurdle for usability and for people in screen readers, although they do have audio options. Uh, it, it can be very frustrating if you fill in a form and then have difficulty filling this in. So uh, if accessibility is a real concern for you, you may want to turn that off. Although, they, like I said, Google does say it's, it's uh, accessible. Not everyone uh, agrees with that. Um, the other thing is you see unexpected screen changes. And again, that's when I was talking about the ARIA standard where we, we actually alert the, the screen reader and say, hey, your page has changed, you got new content here. Um, and then the other big one that I, I like to always talk about to people is this ambiguous links and buttons. So what I see a lot of the times is really ambiguous links, like a lot of click here's or learn mores or, or links that don't have the purpose in them. So you really want to avoid that. So just on this slide here, you can see the idea is you never say here or more uh, you have to say something very descriptive and give the purpose in your links. So if you guys are writing your own links for your own buttons or um, putting your own descriptions in there, make sure you're never, never putting click here or learn more or anything like that. Um, you have to say what the user is going to get. And then the last thing I, I see a lot of that I always like to remind people of is when you're writing instructions, you've got to really be concise and consistent chunk out your content to a really small amount. I see sometimes bullet points, people put in a bullet point that may have 25 words in it, and that is not a bullet point at that point. Bullet points should be four or five words. It shouldn't be full complete sentences. If you're putting sentences in, you're not using bullet points correctly, and your instructions need to be clear and concise. Um, and I just listed here, like, if you ever want to check your reading level of your content, MS Word's got a nice checker on it. Same with readable.io. You can paste any content you want in there, and it'll help you to, uh, to form it or or put an appropriate reading level for your uh, clients. So as I was saying before, almost unwrapping this part up, if you ever find anything or you suspect something, just give support a call or an email or go through your community portal uh, and we'll help you with that. But as of that, I just wanted to open up a discussion then. Hopefully that uh, helped answer a few questions right off the bat. Hello? Hello. Hi, I have a question. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm from uh, Toronto Arts Council. I work at Toronto Arts Council. I'm just wondering, um, so our uh, outward facing portal uh, for our clients is still in classic mode. I'm wondering if uh, what you've discussed kind of applies to that as well, or is it just more oh. on Arcadia? No, we, we're doing our, focusing our testing on Arcadia uh, okay. right now. 
So, so like the, the the classic mode is none of none of that really applies to. No, we don't. We're not testing the classic mode for accessibility currently. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sorry. Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I have one other question, actually, um, if there are none other ones. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so like you did talk about uh, uh, some some things that we can do, like, for example, the links that we put in and everything, but um, uh, with regards to like buttons or like attach here's or things like that that we put in within our, app, in our application, um, is there like, do we... Do we need to like fill in the description tag? Will that help with accessibility on on uh, what uh, our clients are seeing, or is that something that that's already been thought about on your end? Um, yeah, all, all of the tags usually get automatically filled, but the things that you kind of want to worry about is any button label, like any buttons or yeah. any link. So like, if you have a button that's open, maybe you want to say, you know, open budget, you know, so they right. They, they can get it because the idea is when they're running through that page, they're mm -hmm. tabbing through the links, and all they get is they get a bunch of opens. You got four opens on the page; they can't right. tell the difference. They got to guess. Yeah. So you want to make sure your your text is just a descriptive enough that they know, hey, I really want to press that button, or I, or maybe I don't. Right. So I guess what my question is though. So for example, if I'm in configuration mode, and uh, I open like a button. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, you can usually change the button label. Right. So there's the label, there's the field name, and there's the caption, and then there's the description. Um, and then the button. the label is like what gets to be uh, what Correct. the screen reader is reading, or is it like do we need to fill out the description, the caption? Or does that show up anywhere? Or no, uh, if it's just a button, you want yeah. the button label. That'll yeah. be the that'll be the link text in the button. Okay. And that'll be what's exposed, and that's what the, it'll read to them. Right. And then what about like input fields? Because I know, like for example, if you're if you're uh, trying to make things accessible in in Acrobat, you have to like uh, put a description in inputs and pictures and things like that. Uh, is there anything that we have to do uh, for custom fields that have like inputs in them? No, that's automatically done for you. What happens okay. is whatever your caption is, yep. so you have a a label for and it automatically wraps the input and the label for to say this caption belongs to this input so the screen okay. will identify the two together amazing awesome yeah Thank now you one, of the, one, it's one of the things i'd like to also kind of um suggest too is uh, i like to always suggest using single columns a lot of times people are are trying to use multiple two three columns because they want to use all that white space on the page but actually for accessibility it's it's it's, I like to recommend in a single column because then you don't have to think about do I go left to right, do I go up to down. Uh, if I'm using a screen magnifier, there's no chance of going to get cut off the screen. Um, so usually um, I like to recommend for especially our newer implementations, I know you're in classic, but to start going to more of a single column layout for uh, just ease of use, usability and accessibility wise. Okay. It's not mandatory, but it's kind of a, something I like to suggest to people yeah, to make it easier. Sure. What about spacers? I know that there's like a function that we have where like it, it's just like a space thing that happens in between uh, one custom field to another, just so that there's a space. Does that does that is that bad for the screen readers or the accessibility? Uh, I actually I I haven't seen any spaces. I guess you're using like a read only or something maybe or a display only with. Some... Uh, yeah, I think it's a. I can I can pull one up, but I'm pretty okay. sure there's. It's it's probably fine. Um, okay. I mean, if if you need it, you need it. I don't think it's going to have any negative impact. Okay. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Great. So Mark, it's Andrew here from the Toronto Arts Council. If we do some yeah. of our independent testing on our classic portal that our users are using, you know, using the Wave or or another tool, and we find something that needs improvement, are, are we still able to um, get some support from from Smart Simple to fix it? Uh. I, I, I would assume so. I'm, see, we're really trying to move everyone over to, to Arcadia. So I, I, I have to talk with the team. It would depend on what it was. Like if, it's a, if it's a real substantial issue, I, I'm assuming we get it functional for you for sure. Um, 
you know, I think we have to take that by case by case as to as to what it was we found, because we really do want to switch everyone over to Arcadia, and that's where our focus is. So my, my hope is that we could switch you over to Arcadia at some point, uh, and then that would be a, a null uh, issue, right? But if you find right. something, we'll, we'll, you know, I'm sure we'll do our best to try and make sure it's at least functional uh, and usable. Right. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. For the best effort. Any other questions? Are we still uh, are we still talking about questions re related to the the presentation that was made, or just an, an open discussion on on uh, uh, practices uh, within our organizations? I, I think it's open. I think just go go for it. Yeah, um, we didn't have uh, any uh, specific uh, case with the clientels uh, with the disabilities uh, until recently. And uh, I wanted to know if uh, any of the organizations, besides offering uh, web access, uh, have encountered um, a situation where they have uh, to uh, to uh, help uh, physically or uh, get the people to their offices and how they dealt with the uh, disability, uh, disabled people, uh, people with uh, uh, special needs. Have you ever experienced that? Uh, how did you uh, um, uh, support uh, th this needs, those needs? Hi, uh, this is Mohammed from Toronto Arts Council. So uh, something that we've implemented this year um, has been an accessibility grant. Uh, that's uh, uh, an additional amount of funding uh, for applicants uh, with disabilities and disability co uh, accessibility costs. Yeah. As well, uh, we have an uh, we have a application support program now that offers uh, people that are applying for our, uh, for our uh, grants to be able to hire someone that will transcribe their application, so to speak, within our system. Okay, so and the application support is something that uh, you are funding, or or yeah. is it different from the accessibility grant? It's different from the accessibility grant. It's a it's a it's a different kind of like. So this is just so you can apply for uh, funding, uh, and then yeah. within your application, we also offer like. Uh, Another grant that uh, will help you cover the cost. Yeah, additional. Yeah, yeah, additional cost, costs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. And uh, it's it's a follow-up question on this. Did you um, have uh, you implemented uh, uh, different ways of ap ap applying? Uh, let's say non-text-based um, or uh, number-based. Uh, uh, let's say uh, video um, uh, application processes, uh, where applicants, you know, can submit a video and instead of writing down uh, what their uh, request is. Right. Yes. Yeah. So that that's when the uh, the um, application support program kicks in. Is like they can hire someone to do that work for them, so to speak, uh, and then uh, hand in the application to us. Um, but we've also just kind of uh, we've just started this program, so uh, it's it's been on a case by case basis, so to speak, that we're yeah. making these decisions. So yeah. But yeah. just just to clarify, it's Andrew here. The application support still needs to result in an application submitted online in written form. We don't have yeah. a process of the TAC yet for video applications or audio file application, but it's a really compelling idea, and uh, thinking about it. Yeah, because uh, let's say uh, the uh, Quebec Arts Council is uh, will be moving towards uh, video applications, especially for uh, indigenous uh, arts programs. Uh, that's that's one example that I have in mind. Okay. Awesome. All right. So here, sorry, here's Mark again. Question for you: Were you guys considering using the uh, the media library with like the mobile uploads functionality to uh, to do that, so that someone could directly log in and just upload a video direct off their phone? Or how are how are you thinking of doing the video applications? So I'm just curious. Oh, uh, we're we're not we're we're thinking about it. But what I know is that uh, Quebec, the Quebec, uh, we are separate from the or well, the Montreal Arts Council. So it's it's Quebec implementing this. I don't know how they're going to do it. But I didn't know that the uh, mobile upload was an option. I know that uh, people can upload uh, uh, 
uh, different files or links but uh, I, I didn't know that there wasn't a mobile upload. So that's, but that's one thing that we will consider in, in, the, in the near future, you know, uh, having more flexibility in ways people can uh, uh, submit or what they can submit. So, so we're cool. still, uh, yeah. So how, how does the mobile upload? Uh, it's just uh, they are um, writing their grant and then they shoot something and they just uh, upload it? Yeah, well, I mean, they could do the, they could apply for the grant right on the phone itself and then upload it. Um, there's also, uh, we could send someone a link and then they can just, someone else could be writing it for them and then they could just email them a link and they can click that link and upload it direct too. So you can have someone else do the legwork in the background and then uh, just have them send the file via a link. So there's, okay. there's, some, there's some things that you could talk to and, and probably see with uh, somebody, the account manager okay. or something. Okay. Um, sorry, I have a question with what with regards to what you just said. So you can kind of uh, create a unique link for an application to send to someone uh, that they can then fill out and press submit. Is that correct? It's yeah. What we can do is we it's a it's a multi-file upload field, uh, and I don't want to get too technical here, but yeah, we've got a custom field, and that okay. custom field is uh, we call it media library, and the media library. Uh, has functionality where you can turn on a mobile upload. So you can go and get the link. Uh, there's a QR code that you can use or a link that you can get and you copy that link and then you can send direct to that uh, field. And so if you already had an application with that field in it, theoretically you could give someone that link and they could just upload the file. Huh. So that, 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 works, that works for a single field and so not, it doesn't give a, a permission or access to the entire uh, grant, huh? Well, yeah, you could go right to the field. So, uh, for example, we used at one of our conferences. We gave everybody the link, and when we were at the conference, they were taking pictures, and then I'll upload it to a single field, and then that way we could look at all of everyone's pictures from that event. So that's and, kind of how we used it. Yeah, and, and sorry, the media library uh, only works with um, uh, pictures, videos, PDF files. Uh, you can upload text into the media library, correct? Yeah, you can you can do. Uh, well, I know it does video, it does audio and uh, images. Uh, the multi-file upload you can do uh, text. I assume it does text. I'd have to check. I can't remember. I usually use it just for just for audio and video and uh, images. Right. Okay. Thank you. Just so Okay. Sorry, I was just um I wanted to bring up this question sent over by uh, the California Arts Council mm -hmm. recently. How would users, um, admin or the general public know like what um, progress towards accessibility goals? Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So I mean, like I said, every every upgrade. Um, and we do. We run through a testing cycle, and anything we find, uh, we log a ticket for, and it's usually resolved within that testing cycle. So usually every every three months, um, you know, in coinciding with the upgrade, we will be fixing anything that we have found or anything that anyone else has discovered uh, in the system. So uh, as to what's changing right now, the newest thing is that we're we're starting to do our testing using the voiceover, um, and you know, that, that's kind of our, our next step in the accessibility process. Um, and then I guess we'll go from there, depending on what people have uh, discover or uh, what we discover internally um, towards our, our roadmap in this way. Okay, anything else? Um. No, I think um, I was about to ask uh, for specific, uh, if you have any uh, specific information uh, regarding uh, Quebec or Canada legislation, because you, you guys uh, spoke uh, briefly about Ontario and the rest of um, and the states. Uh, if you have mm -hmm. some piece of information, I, I'd love to uh, to um, to get it from you if you if you have that. Sure. Otherwise, I'll do my research. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not too familiar with Quebec legislation, but. Um, you know, uh, anything you find, feel free to send over to us, or I can look them and send over to you. Um, okay. 
I mean, I find a lot of the legislations are very have a lot of commonalities between them. Um, yeah. Is there's usually an international standard on these things, um, but uh, there may be some specifics uh, in Quebec. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Julian, I wanted to um, I wanted to share a question um, that you asked um, just recently to the rest of the group. Um, how do you manage? I'm addressing this to the rest of the group. How do you manage relationships with um, your your clients that have special needs or visual impairment? <laughs> would like to share some best practices of how you, how you manage your relationships with your with your applicants or grantees that um, um that have special needs and, um, I think that's it so far um well, we're going to try and wrap up this call then. If anyone wants a recording of the call, uh, send me an email and I can put together something for you, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.